This is a short video to explain the source code that I've put on the internet to show how you can do involute gearing in Blender and basically any other uh, thing if you translate the source code um, for free day modeling. Uh, it'll also explain you how to do intermeshing perfectly. The difference between this video and many other videos is that it also shows you how to intermesh perfectly two gears. It not only shows you how to create one gear, but also how to create the other gear and how to intermesh them at the right distance. Okay, uh, go to my website newcvt.com, go to the source code, download the top one, uh, which is... Um, an abbreviated version of the uh, source code for the invention. It only the small version only shows you how to do the um, intermeshing between two gears. All the other stuff is cut out because you don't need it if you just want to do gears. Okay, go to um, File, Open, and then uh, download or open the source code that you've downloaded. Okay, what you get is then is this, uh, press the little uh, triangle there, comes blue, and then you see we have two gears intermeshing. And if you turn your little mouse wheel, you can zoom in if you've got your mouse hovering over the uh, picture. By the way, in Blender, it's always important that if you want to type something, put your mouse cursor in the typing area. If you want to do whatever uh, area your mouse is over, is the one that has focus. So it's not that you click somewhere and it remains focused. No, where the mouse is. That's a bit irritating in Blender. Um, here you see default angle, default angle resolution, um, higher this, uh, so t t basically for example to this, if you wanted to compile really quickly, but as we've only got two uh, gears, this is um, fast enough. Smaller, you get more detailed gears, um, you get the point. But for two gears, this is quick enough. For the invention, you mostly use this when you're working and you're uh, in designing, because otherwise it just takes too long to wait. Uh, I'm not a specialist in Blender, um, so forgive me, there's probably all kinds of uh, improvements that you can do, um, however, it works. Um, reference circle radius, what you need to know, if, I, uh, for example, I click on modeling and if I show you the reference circle, if you imagine two cylinders uh, rotating or rolling over each other, then they have a radius. That radius, they're rotating exactly the same speed as the gears are rotating. That radius for each cylinder is known as the reference circle radius or, radius or the pit circle. Um, it's a very simple formula, but it's one that you really need if you want to calculate the distance of putting the gears. If you do that, um, the next question you're going to have is, OK, I've got my perfect uh, distance. But, you'll notice here, if I make these teeth thicker, then they wouldn't fit. If I make them thinner, they wouldn't fit. For that, to calculate them perfectly for the uh, right uh, reference circle, the right pitch circle, you need to have the angle from here going up the... No, uh, yes. Through the center tooth line to here. And the reason it's there, there's a kind of a base circle that goes around here, in this gear. That's where all these so-called involute curves start. They all start on the base circle. Actually, it's a cylinder. Uh, if you look at my other videos, you will understand it's a cylinder. Um, and that's where all these things start. The starting angle, which you use to, to calculate where you put this start, this uh, involute curve, because that determines how thick or thin the tooth is. That angle is from here, so this line, going to this point where it starts. That's the starting angle. For the starting angle, there's a formula. Uh, very simple. That's this. I also wrote an article about how to deduct the starting angle. Read that if you want to know more. Okay, um, then there is the function for creating conical involute gears, spur gears and helical gears. Uh, it's this function. Uh, I'll explain more later. You can just copy and paste. Um, basically, uh, what it does, it... Um, creates the 3D involute uh, shape 
and then it just cuts pieces off. So it doesn't use the formula for involute, uh, for, for, uh, involute curves. Uh, it just creates the 3D involute shape and then it uh, cuts the pieces off that it needs, but that doesn't need. And by the way, this is freely scripted, this video, so I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, please forgive me. Okay, this is the main source code for the, uh, the what we're doing. It's a general example involute gear into meshing. Uh, the angle resolution... And here is my first mistake because I don't think I'm using this anymore. I'm using now the default uh, everywhere. But basically it's the same I just explained. Spur gear, yes or no. False in this case. Because here you can see we're creating a, con con an inv a conical involute gear. Look, you can see, I can show you better. Uh, see? not as it's wider on the top as at the bottom and if i show you the other gear that's exactly the opposite because they uh, one points one way the other points the opposite way their axes always need to be parallel yes i know there are most examples of conical involute gears and with non-parallel axes uh, but if you want to do it correctly, um, use parallel axes if you want to know why uh, and you're a theoretician i'll happily explain it um and here you can see them nicely. And if you do here object mode, you get a nicer picture. And you press the spacebar while your mouse is in the uh, viewing area and you see it moves. See? You can make it move faster, but I'll explain that later. Okay. Um, these are conical involute gears. But supposing we say, okay, we don't want, we want a spur gear, then we change false to true. Oh, no, I didn't have my mouse in the viewing area. So I was typing, but nothing happened. Okay, you see now we have a different type of gear. These are called spur gears because they are straight up. I can show you. See, now we have the same picture, only the lines are going straight up. They're as wide as the bottom as on, on the top. See, and we can press the space bar again, and then nicely and perfectly into match, into mesh, by the way. Here, if I press the Z, come on. See, perfect. Okay, press the space bar. Okay, that's the spur gear, number of teeth. A is the red one, so if I say OK, um, OK, 12 teeth, now 12 teeth for both, and we have two 12 teeth gear. OK, helical angle, uh, take some time to play with that yourself. Um, I'll show you, I'll just zoom down what helical angle does. Helical angle of 1. For those interested, means that you go from here to here, and that it rotates itself from there to there. That's one. So if it's a half, then it goes to half the distance. So it's one tooth helical distance. Okay, offset. Um, let's change it back to eight teeth, and let's do offset of point five. Okay, what happens? Look, all of a sudden our red gear is a lot thicker and our green, uh, the teeth of our gray, green gear are a lot thinner. Well, if I make it zero again. See, now they're the same. Uh, this is useful if, for instance, um, you have a small gear with very few teeth and a very big gear with many teeth. Uh, the small gear will be more brittle. Um, then it's useful to make the small gear, the teeth, a little bit thicker so that they're all equally strong. Backlash in reality. Um, when you create a transmission, if you have zero backlash, like what you have here. I'll show better here. Z, a little blue one. No, Z. Press the wrong one somehow. Oh, and then you 
go on the hand and you then move, keep it mouse pressed while you're moving it. Okay, you can see here I have no space in between the two sides. If you have this in a real transmission, uh, because there's always some little error in production, it'll be slightly too big while it's moving. Sometimes it'll fit perfectly, but during the rotation there will be points where the teeth just take up too much space and they get stuck. You don't want that. So what they do in reality, they use a little bit of backlash. Let's exaggerate a little bit here. Okay, and what have we got now? Now we've got a big hole in between the two gears. So now it doesn't get stuck anymore. Normally in real transmissions you don't use a hole this big, by the way. See, and it's still nicely into meshes. Okay, oh, well, I'm going to stop there. I'll put backlash back to zero. Height of the gears. Um, simple basically this height um, let's make it one oh, I suppose I can show you like oh come on uh, okay and now we do it again and they're all of a sudden a lot flatter see that's what height of the gears does. I'll put it back to five, that looks better. Okay, if we have spur gears, so now we're looking, if it is spur gear, a pressure angle in degrees of 20. In the gearing world, they like to do everything in degrees, so I put 20 uh, degrees, is the standard for spur gears these days. And height of teeth, height in teeth, um, that's something that's really useful when you're doing conical involute gears. It doesn't really make any sense in conical involute, in spur gears, so I will put it at zero. However, if you if it's not a spur gear, meaning a conical involute gear, the pressure angle is in degrees, and now I'm using a formula, is the aton 0 0.5, and then, I've, because this is in radians, I move it to degrees. And the reason I'm doing that is because here I'm taking all the stuff in degrees and putting it back into radians. Uh, everything in the, in the software is actually done in radians. It's 26.6 degrees and the height in teeth here is 1. In the invention the height in teeth is 3. Um, basically, um, look at my other videos to, to uh, understand how you can use the unit of the number of teeth uh, for gears. It's much more practical to use a unit of number of teeth and then to scale everything afterwards than to try and use real values. It makes the formulas more easy and it makes understanding everything a lot more easy. Okay, then we have where we need to start drawing them. The distance between the... Um, the pitch circles, so this is the pitch circles for the red one, and this is for the green one. So the distance between the axis and the points where they touch, basically, where they, if they were cylinders, where they would touch. Um, this is a slight explanation of the formula, but you can also read the article I wrote. I'll leave a description in the comments. Okay, then we have the start angle for the red one. And here you have the formula we just saw, but this is in case you want to, no, okay, so we, here you have two teeth of the same height, you have no backlash, and then it's only this formula. However, if you say okay, I want to make the red teeth bigger and the green teeth smaller or reverse. Then you fill in something for offset and that is what we filled in here to make it bigger and smaller. And the same thing is for backlash. So we all these things we put together, divide by the number of teeth and then plus the starting original starting our calculator. Here you also see the height in teeth. And this is what we used here. For a spur gear you see it's zero, so it makes no difference. But for a conical involute gear it does make a difference. Um, and the reason for that, and let's quickly go back to conical involute gears. Okay. 
Okay. Now, um, yes, let's just move it nicely. The center line of this intermeshing is where the reference circles up where you calculate it with the formula. So with the pitch circles, where the two cylinders are. The, so this is calculated for the right, but you'll notice at the top, this red gear is more to the center of the red, and at the bottom it's more to the center of the green. So for a conical involute gears, you can't just say, okay, the reference circle is this. Um, it seems to be moving. It doesn't because you're actually having cylinders and those cylinders don't go up and down. If you were to look uh, look at my other video, you can see it's actually a cylinder. But a starting angle was the top. Hang on. Was the top of our involute curve, and that is now not at the reference, but here. So we need to. Um, it's it's smaller. See, if I look at the um, if I look at the green teeth, they seem to be bigger than the red teeth. But that's only because I'm looking at the top of the red teeth and the bottom, basically. Although because it's turned around, it's also. But basically, they're they're f thinner at the top than at the bottom. If you look at the red one, see. The red one at the bottom, they're very thick. At the top, they're thin. So you need, but you need to start your angle at calculating at the thin part. That's why you say, okay, we have a height of one tooth, and we put that in this part of the formula, and then it basically makes the starting angle a little bit more smaller, so that as the as you start on the top of the conical involute gear, you'll calculate it at the right position. See? And the same thing here for the green. The green gear, by the way, is turned upside down. We'll do that. That's what we do here. Because you'll notice... Um, the red gear is pointing upwards. The green gear is pointing downwards with its, point, with its uh, conical envelope uh, direction. So we need to turn one round. And here we've basically rotated the, num the, the green one 180 degrees so that it's pointing downwards, because otherwise they would be pointing the same way. Okay, then we have here, uh, we set the color for gear A. So we do the red one. And you can also, if you want to do very nice things in uh, Blender, uh, you can. Uh, nice metallic and so forth. Uh, that's all very possible. The reason I didn't do it is because red and green and these settings are very nice to show you how it works. Uh, graphically speaking, you can do much, much nicer things in Blender. Blender is really good at that. And here for the green. Okay, then we draw. Now we've set up our materials. Now we're going to draw first the red gear. We use our function. And you'll notice a lot of it is rammed out, meaning the, uh, behind the gray. Um, the location, that simple blender, rotation, number number of teeth is the number of teeth. Uh, we've already done it. Height in teeth. If you put zero here, you get a spur gear. Uh, that's why we put the uh, the, the height, uh, the number of teeth. For the invention, I'm using free, but um, yes, look at the other videos to understand that better. And here, I'm just explaining how to create uh, involute meshing, good meshing of involute gears, and the number of extra teeth. Um, um, Yes, that's the, I just explained that. Okay, the angle start. Yes, the helical angle. I've also uh, explained. And the angle resolution is your resolution. Uh, there's also a bevel factor if you want to play with it. Um, I'll leave that for you to figure out. What is um, something that you should do is tip cut as the number of extra teeth. Uh, I happen to know that mine it might look, uh, look perfect at the moment, but it's not. Okay, let's show you what I mean. And how to solve the problem. Here I'm going to view it as. No, come on, give me object mode. Okay, now watch. 
we see perfect intermeshing of the conical influent gears. Perfect, perfect, perfect. We're looking at what's happening, what's happening, what's happening. Okay. Uh, no, I can better show you an animation. Um, back to wireframe. Zoom in a bit. If you're into meshing gears and you want it more than to just look perfectly. Okay. Well, at this point, let's zoom in a little bit more. Let's put them at the point where they touch just. Okay, at this point, it seems to be touching here, just about touching. Okay, and now let's look, because if something touches on the other side, because here we just started it, it should also still be touching. But if you zoom in here, you see it's not touching. So here there would potentially be a problem, because these gears could rattle a little bit at this point. They're not perfectly aligned, although with backlash you wouldn't really mu but you want it a little bit longer. So you've seen here, I've cut the teeth here, but actually you want to make them a little bit longer, and you can find that out by doing what I just did. And you do that by tip cut at a number of extra teeth, you fill in something that seems to be better, and you solve that problem. Okay, now so far we've done little scaling. Here you can, with simple blender function, you scale it to the right thing you want it. Okay, um, something else you need to do. If you're, hang on, wrong one, Z. Okay, you will notice my, oh no, hang on, bloop. When I do, this one is pointed with the tooth exactly on the center line, and this one is with the root in the center. The root, by the way, roots are those holes between the teeth. The roots is here in the center line, and here the tooth is. In. So I shifted the green one half a tooth. See? And that's what you do here. So that's what that's for. Uh, here we draw the green gear with the stuff which is calculated. Uh, and here is the animation. Uh, if I do that. It basically tells you how many steps there are in the animation. And now all of a sudden we're turning a lot quicker because we've using less frames. Um, and here we set up the camera. And that's basically it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, it's all very simple, as you see. I'm not using a lot of the stuff that you find on other internet uh, videos. Um, all kinds of difficult descriptions on uh, involute gearing and in the involute curve. The involute curve um, is basically um, the result of the 3D involute shape rotating. Um, it's making something that is really easy, namely two uh, triangles rotating and pressing against each other uh, into something very difficult. It's a little bit like um, living in a two-dimensional world and not realizing that everything you're seeing is somehow come from a three-dimensional world. Um, if you look, for example, at a cube or the wireframe of a cube and you make this, this shadow on the wall of that and you move it, you'll find it does all kinds of very difficult to explain um, shapes and figures, uh, but if you look at the cube in three dimensionals, it's very simple to understand. The same thing is going on with the involute uh, gearing. In 3D, it's easy to understand. In 2D, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, also, in involute gearing, um, there's a lot of history that people like to uh, stick uh, to. In the old days, um, they used to... Uh, Cutting gears was difficult. Uh, they had a machine, very expensive, so they'd like to use the same machine for cutting all the gears. Uh, that's why they uh, say that all the pressure angles need to be the same uh, and so forth. Um, but I can show you actually directly that in reality, yes, uh, officially yes, because we're talking. But if you take any cross-section 
of these two gears into meshing and you look at what kind of uh, two-dimensional gear would I have to create then you'll find out that the pressure angles going down uh, or up in these gears uh, start to change yes officially it's the active pressure angle blah 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 but in reality it's the same gear so if you want to create a gear with the old formulas you would just change the pressure angle um, and you can see here this pressure angle of the green gear here is lower than the pressure angle of the red gear and the change is in opposite directions because they are pointing in opposite directions so there's only actually at the reference circle height at the center height here that they are the same pressure angles for the rest they are all different so there are lots of things uh, if you read in the history that you think hang on that's not quite correct uh, you can understand historically speaking why that is because you had the machines that were expensive also it's a lot easier to understand what's going on if you've got 3d software like blender anybody can download blender for free uh, that's simple it's very powerful um, blender by the way is not really designed for engineering but because it's designed to make beautiful pictures and you can zoom in really well and with wireframes you can understand really well what's going on so although blender is a bit of a pain um, it's also very powerful um, here I've got simple red and green, but you can make them into beautiful metallic ones, uh, make them really, really looking realistic. The problem is if you make them metallic, uh, you can't really see so well what's going on. So from a theoretical point of view, um, it's better to make them red and green. Uh, for uh, If you're looking to make something uh, nice looking, something realistic looking, uh, they don't need to be red and green. Also something here, hang on, you see these little points where the involute curve starts and the roots start between the where the convolute involute the the, the the involute curve starts and where the root starts these little points these little uh, corners they don't need to be there they're only there because as i want to understand what the uh, gears are doing uh, i want to really see the difference where the base circle is you can just make them if you want uh, a different shape uh, you'll have to change a little bit of the source code uh, to make the root different um, but there is no f the only function that the root has is has is that it uh, that, that that it doesn't cut into the teeth as they ro are rotating. You could make them any shape you wanted as long as they don't cut. Um, what else can I explain? Um, yes, if you need any help, let me know. Uh, read uh, look at the other videos and look at the article I wrote. Uh, it'll help you explain a lot. Um, oh yes, uh, give me, you, you, I'd really appreciate some likes and stuff if you want. Uh, tell others about uh, this intermeshing video um, and I'd like to know basically what people think of it. Okay, um, and if you need help, um, ask me. Okay, thank you.